this second letter to the church of the Thessalonians. May God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Your faith is growing more and more despite your hardships and suffering. God uses this persecution to develop us, but judgment will come for those who abuse you. The end is coming, but it will not come until the Antichrist is first revealed. He will exalt himself over everything and proclaim himself to be God. Many will follow him, but will be lost forever because of it. The day is coming for the glorious appearing of the Lord Jesus, and we will come with him from heaven with his powerful angels. Jesus will overthrow the Antichrist with just a word spoken, and he will reign over all creation in triumph. God has chosen you to be saved by the work of his spirit and by your faith. May you continue to be faithful to the Lord and walk in obedience to him so that the Lord Jesus may be glorified in and through your life. Until that day, we will all be together with our Lord. Well, happy Mother's Day, everybody. So glad that you're here today. Yesterday, I was at Walmart, and at Walmart, I noticed there was a man with two little kids sort of trailing him, two little girls, and the girls looked to me to be between three and four years old, and they looked to be twins, and both of the little girls were singing, as they were following their dad, they were singing at the top of their voices, let it go, let it go, because I don't care anymore, and they were singing it over and over again. Now, they were singing, trying to sing the lyrics of a song, of a movie, and what was the movie? Frozen. See, you knew it. I knew it. And you're asking the question, how did you know it? Because, okay, my kids are grown and gone. Because I have grandkids. That's how I know. Did you know that I have actually watched the movie Frozen somewhere between 10 to 15 to 20 times? I'm serious. And I don't know. I lost count way back there. Years ago, I lost count. I have watched that movie so many times. And here's the deal. Every time we have any of our grandkids that are over and they spend the night, Part of the coming to Poppy and Anna's house is that we have movie night every night, and they get to select which movie they want to see. And so we were in this zone that it was frozen every single night. This was like Groundhog Day. Remember that movie? It was every single night. Well, you know, when you have watched Frozen so many times, I now knew all the lines. I knew every line before it came. So this on this particular, and this was, now Emily just turned eight yesterday. So it was about two years ago or more. And so she would have been about five and a half, six years old. And it's a movie night. And there is Jude and Emily and me, and we're up there in front of Poppy's big TV, and we're watching Frozen. And Emily is sitting on my lap because that was is also what has happened. In fact, did you know, there are movie nights in which I've got all four kids on my lap. At least I did. They're getting too big now. But on my lap. And so there's Emily, and she's sitting on my lap. Well, I know, I know in every, all the lines. And so I started whispering in her ear the line just before it was said. And then the character would say their line. And then I would whisper the next line, and then the character would say the line. It was perturbing to her, but she didn't do anything. So I thought, I'm going to keep doing it. And then she had enough. All the grace was gone. And she turned around and she put her hands on my face and nose to nose and said, Poppy, you're talking too much. <laughs> and it's one of my wonderful Poppy memories forever. Aren't kids great? Most incredible human beings on the planet. And here is a woman in Sunday school. She's teaching a group of first grade graders, and she's trying to help them to understand that you get to heaven. The Bible teaches us that we cannot get to heaven by being good. The Bible says it over and over. We can't get to heaven by being good. We only get to heaven by knowing Jesus as our Savior. And she's teaching these children that truth. And when she gets done with that, 
she now has them all gathered, and she, she sort of, it's sort of application moment. She wants to see if they really learn. So here's what she says. She says, if I, if I sold, okay, kids, if I sold my house and my car and everything that I own and I gave it all to God, would that get me into heaven? And all the kids yelled, no. And the teacher then said, ask, but what if I went to church every single week and I did good things for a lot of different people and I even sang in the choir, would that get me into heaven? And all the kids yelled back, no. And then she said, well, then if none of those things work, how can I get to heaven? And a little boy yelled out, you got to be dead. The God of this universe, who created everything there is, also created heaven. And God wants us to know how we can spend eternity in heaven. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Today is Mother's Day. Yay, God, for moms, right? Yay, God, for moms. Honestly and truthfully, I don't know where you get the energy. I don't know where you get the tenacity and the wisdom, but I know you have it, and I'm really grateful. I grew up as a little boy looking at my mother, and I remember many times me thinking to myself, I think I've got the greatest mom ever. We had such a great relationship. My mom has been in heaven for a year. And as though an adult, and watching my wife, Kathy, mother our sons, I was so amazed. Everything that goes into this and all the details and all she remembers and all she does and the care and, and all the stuff that Kathy did to mother our two sons. And I remember thinking, and I still feel it today, She's got to be the greatest mom ever. And I know that is exactly what every one of you feel about the moms in your life. And I want to say to every mom here, but not just every mom, I want to say to every woman in this room, I want to say to every woman in this room, I thank God for the strength that you bring to your home and you bring to this church I thank God for the impact that you are making in this world, in your part of the world, because collectively, all of you are making such an amazing difference. I just want to say, thank God for you today. Amen. We've been going through the book of 2 Thessalonians together, and what's amazed us is that this book is actually a miniature book of Revelation. Who would have thought? And as we've been walking through the book of 2 Thessalonians he doesn't deal, Paul doesn't deal with all the stuff that John deals with in the book of Revelation, but he deals with several things. We've already heard him say, hey, I want to tell you, there is a judgment coming for all of those who are Christ followers and for all of those who are not. And he has said to us that when the end of the world is coming close, there will arise this this world leader that the Bible calls the Antichrist, and Paul gives us in chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians all kinds of information about this guy who will arise. And then Paul reminded us that Jesus is coming back and what's going to happen when he returns. And he even alludes to this great last battle that the Bible talks about in many places in the Scripture, the last battle between God and Satan, between Christ and Antichrist, that is called the Battle of Armageddon, and we looked at that last week. And it is as though at this very point that the Apostle Paul sort of does exactly what little Emily did with me, sort of put his hands on our face and nose to nose, and say, wouldn't you come to know Jesus as your Savior too? In light of all that is going to happen, in light of all that God is doing, won't you come and receive Christ as your Savior too? Listen to how he puts it in First, uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because from the beginning God chose you to be saved 
How? Through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel. The word gospel simply means the good news about Jesus Christ that you might share in the glory of what our Lord Jesus Christ, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now the question I think some of you in this room, I already know that there are many in this room, and like me, you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, and, and God is, is so much at work in your life now in, in growing. But there may be some in this room, I think there are, that are in your heart of hearts are saying to yourself, well, why? Who gives a rip? Why worry about whether there is a God? Why? Who cares about Jesus Christ? Why should I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior? I want to give you an illustration that I think can help with that, and it's right over here. I have a rope, and it's a, it's a long one. We're not going to stretch it all the way out. I'd have to go quite a ways. But I want you to imagine that this rope is the timeline of your life. This rope is the timeline of your life. And I also want you to imagine also that this rope doesn't have an ending. Now, the rope out here does, but I want you to think, imagine this rope kind of going, circling around the earth twice and then out into outer space, and it has no ending. Because this is what the Bible says about us, that we are actual, actually eternal beings. Now, you see the red part at the end of the rope? This represents the time of your lifespan on the earth, the time you spend on planet earth. This, it's just so short, isn't it? It comes and goes, and before you know it, it's done. You know, the crazy thing is, is that so many people spend the whole time on planet earth just thinking about, the stuff on planet earth just thinking about my life now and where am i going to work and what am i going to do and 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 all the stuff of this life on earth and don't think one thing about the rest of their life just a little part and all their attention is on this one little part and don't even think at all about the rest of their life the bible says that the whole purpose, or at least the gr one great purpose, the primary purpose of our time on the earth is to get us ready for the rest of our life in eternity. And we do that first by coming to know the God that made us. Through coming to know His Son, Jesus Christ, who came to introduce us to God. And if you come to know Christ as Savior, then... The purpose that God has in store for you and I, Paul talked about in the very first chapter of 2 Thessalonians. You remember that Paul said to us now, spend every moment of your life with intentionality. You've come to know Christ as your Savior, yay, that's wonderful. Now spend every moment of your life with intentionality of acts of love and kindness toward God and toward others. Love people who don't love you. Care for people who don't care for you. Care for people who live differently than you. Every person in your life, everyone that God brings along your path, demonstrate acts of love and kindness toward them. And you remember what Paul says, and God will never forget. He will never forget any good thing you do of love and kindness toward God, of love and kindness toward others. Live your life every minute of it with intentionality. This passage of Scripture that I want us to look at this morning is an amazing one because more than any, there's, there's very few passages that say what this particular one does. This one actually brings together two things, two parts of how we come to know Christ as our personal Savior, the work of God behind the scenes and our personal decision to receive Jesus as our Savior. And Paul is saying to every person in this room who has not yet made this decision, would you be open in your heart? Would you come to know the God that made you? And he says, this is actually what God is up to 
in your life behind the scenes. He says, God chose you to be saved through the Holy Spirit's work in your life. What I'm about to say might be some new thoughts for most of the people in the room. The first one is this. No one can come to God unless God invites you to come to him. No one can come to God unless God invites you to come to him. And if you think about it, it makes total sense. Probably everyone in this room have some place that you call home. You go back to, you go to sleep at night, you, you gather with your family at night. You've got a place you call home. And let's just imagine that tonight you are at your house and maybe it's 11 o'clock at night and maybe you've already gone to sleep and the doorbell rings. The doorbell rings at 11 o'clock. It can't be good news, right? And when you look out the window, it's me. I cannot believe this crazy pastor. He is outside my door ringing my doorbell at 11 o'clock. And now you've got to make a decision. Are you going to open the door or not? Now, look, if I am ringing your doorbell at 11, please open the door. i got a good reason. I don't know what it is right now, but I would have a good reason. Open the door. But even if you open the door, I can't barge in. I can't come into your house until you invite me. Heaven is God's home, and the only way that we could ever go to heaven is if he invites us. There's a second thing that I want you to notice, and that, that is this idea. No person can come to know God on your own. Why? Well, first of all, the Bible says every person without Christ is actually spiritually blind. Did you know that? Listen to what he says in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Satan, who is the God, little g, of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They're unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. That if a person has not yet come to know Christ as Savior, the Bible says that their eyes are actually blind to the truths about God. The second thing is, is that every person without Christ is actually spiritually dead. Listen to what Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2 says. Now, this is a paraphrase, but listen to what it says. Since a person is totally lost, spiritually dead, and even blinded to the truth, it's a miracle that anyone ever gets saved. Isn't this an amazing statement? Here is what God is saying to you and me. Every person who does not know God as Savior, their eyes are blinded to the truth, and they are spiritually dead. Well, then how does anyone come to know Jesus as Savior? We are saved only because the Holy Spirit leads us to salvation. And this is what God is wanting to communicate to us in His Word, that Our salvation, first of all, is an incredible work of God, of God calling us to himself, of God putting a want to in our heart, of God coming to us and saying, I love you, would you come to me? Jesus even talks about this this whole idea. It's Jesus speaking when Jesus says in John chapter 16, verse 8, Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and of righteousness and judgment. That word convict actually is a word that means convince. It is God who is at work in the heart of a person that does not know him, convincing them of what? Something's missing in your life. There is an emptiness in your life that nothing can fill but Him. Convincing you of your need for the God who made you. And Jesus says as He's convincing, there are three topics that He talks to us about. The first topic is sin and then righteousness and judgment. What does this mean? Well, the first one is the Holy Spirit does three things to open our eyes about God. He shows us that we are lost because of our sins. 
And those sins have separated us from God. And the greatest sin is the sin of pushing Jesus away. There is a reason why God is so far away. There is a reason why there is no sense of closeness to the God that made you. And the reason is that there is sin between you and him. That sin has separated you from God. And there is no alleviating it on your own. That's the first thing that the Holy Spirit comes to do. He begins to look, say to us, look at your life. Look at the decisions you've made, the direction that you've gone. You are so far away from God. But there's a second thing that he does in our life. The Holy Spirit then shows us that we could be experiencing a right relationship with God if we would put God at the core of our life. I'm so far from God, and it's the sin that has separated me. But he is saying, he's whispering in your ear like I was doing with little Emily. He is whispering in your ear, in your heart, and he's saying, but you could have a right relationship with God. You don't have to be so far away from God. You could know him. You could be close to him if you would allow God into your life. The third thing Jesus is saying is that there is he convinces us of judgment, that there is a judgment that is coming for the person who rejects Jesus. But if you receive him, he will deliver you. You will be delivered. So what does all this mean? It means God's at work in your life. Behind the scenes, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, God is at work in your heart, and he is speaking to your heart, would you come to me? There is an emptiness I can fill. There is a meaning I can, to life I can give to you. There's a relationship you can have with me. And he begins to speak in our heart and draw us to him. And my question to you this morning is, is that happening to you today? Is God drawing you to him? If there is a want to in your heart, you wouldn't have that on your own. Because we're spiritually dead and we're blind. But if there is a want to in your heart, it is only there because of the Holy Spirit of God saying to you, I want you. I want a relationship with you. This is the first thing that Paul says to us. But then there's a second thing that Paul says, that there is also a personal responsibility that we have in this process. God chose you by his grace to be saved by believing the truth of salvation through Christ. We come to know Christ as our Savior by making the decision to do so. There's a couple of verses that I've noticed as we've been going through this book together that sort of jumped out for me about this whole idea of personal responsibility. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 10 it says, they perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. This isn't a passive verb, refused. It's an active one. They chose no, no God. And so God said, okay. There's another verse in 2 Thessalonians 2.13 we're looking at where it says, from the beginning God chose you to be saved through belief in the truth. There's a personal responsibility So how does a person come to Christ, make the decision, yes, I receive Jesus as Savior? There's some things that need to be understood. First of all, the Bible says that all of us are sinners, and we have all fallen short of God's glory. Every one of us have done things wrong. There's not a perfect person in this room. All all of us have done things sinful things. And I'm not talking just about the big things of robbing banks and killing people. I'm talking about sin is defined in the Bible by anything that we say or do or the attitude of heart that is below the perfection of God. Can you imagine all the stuff Look, if a person lived to the age of 70, just sort of the average lifespan, 
add up all the things that that person has said and all the things they've done and, and all the attitudes that they've had. You add them all up, how big is the book? For me, you remember the old telephone directories? Do we still get them? Because I don't know about I don't think we get. Do we get directories anymore? We still do? The Houston telephone directory, that would be my list. Because when you take everything that we have done that is, that, is, that is below the perfection of God, how many things would it be? The sins are amazing. Maybe you're thinking, well, but I've got so many good deeds in my life. I mean, doesn't it all just sort of even out that I've got more good deeds than bad deeds, so I must be okay? This morning, I had scrambled eggs for breakfast, and I ate two eggs, two scrambled eggs. Well, when I was opening up, what if one of those eggs, when I opened it up, was green? And I said to myself, okay, I'm, but I'm eating two eggs. One of them is good, one is green, so it'll cancel each other out, right? Not hardly. And in fact, Let's say that I was really hungry this morning and I ate 12 eggs, which I did not do. But one of them was green. So, so there were 11 good eggs and one rotten egg. The 11 good eggs still wouldn't cancel out the rotten one. You'd still be, I'd be pretty sick right now. And the truth is God is not on a balanced system. We have sin in our life. And now the second thing, the wages of our sin is death. It is separation from God. What we get from our sin is a separation from God. Already you're feeling it. God is so far away. There is this separation between me and God, and it's because of my sin. But what this verse in Romans chapter uh, 6, verse 23 is talking about, the wages of sin is death. That verse is talking about an eternal death. It's not just talking about dying physically. It is talking about an, an eternal separation from God. <sighs> I am spiritually dead because of my sin. The same Bible that tells us that God is loving also tells us that God is just and He must punish our sin. Exodus chapter 34 verse 7 says, God will by no means clear the guilty. And, go, and, and Romans 6 verse 23, the wages of sin is death. I've sinned, and my sin has caused a separation from God. There is also a third thing I want you to note, and it's simply this. God loved us. Even while we were rejecting Him, God loved us, and He sent His Son to rescue us. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says this. It just left my brain. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God showed us his love, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God did not say, get your act together and I'll start loving you. There are people in our lives that say that, but that is not what God says to us. He does not say, get your act together and I'll start loving you. God said to us, I love you even while your act is nowhere close together. And in that condition, God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to come to this earth, to live a perfect life, to die on the cross, to pay the penalty for our sin. When Jesus came, He taught us things about God we would not have known otherwise. And He showed us all kinds of miracles. But the greatest reason Jesus came was to die on that cross. Don't underestimate what he went through. We usually think of him being nailed to the cross, but before the nailing to the cross, he went through a massive amount of torture. Those who were eyewitnesses 
said that what happened to him is that he was taken away and he went to what was called the Praetorium, which was the barracks of the Roman soldiers. And it is there that they began to beat him and torture him. They blindfolded them, him and then hit him one after another from different directions. He didn't know where it was going to come from. In his face, in his side, in his back, in his stomach, one slug after another after another. And then they took thorns and they fashioned it into a crown and they pushed it and hit it on top of his head. So it dug deep into his brow and blood gushing all over. And then after they had beaten him pretty severely, they took him to the whipping post. The whipping post in first century was not a post that he was tied to and it was a post that was only about this high, only about waist high. And they bent him over and they tied his hands in the front and they tied his legs in the back and they bent him over that whipping post. That was first century. Then they took a scourge. A scourging is, is more than just a whipping. A scourging was a whip that was called a cat of nine tails. It had, it had nine uh, uh, different straps of leather. And woven on the ends of the straps of the leather were sharp bone and metal pieces. The guy that produced the whipping was a professional at this. He, he knew exactly how to do it and gain the greatest amount of pain and torture. There is Jesus, and he is tied in the front and tied in the back. This guy with the cat of nine tails whips across Jesus' face, across his back, across his legs, and every time, just as the whip reaches his body, he jerks it back, causing the bone and the metal to dig into the flesh and rip it. And he does it over and over and over and over again. The Jewish people, they, they were only allowed to give 39 whippings, 39 sl uh, 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 slashes, but they, uh, they would stop at 39. They were allowed to give 40. But the Romans had no place to stop, and they could just whip and whip and whip until the guy was almost dead. And that's exactly what they did with Jesus. And in fact, those who were eyewitnesses said that Jesus was so disfigured in his face and his body that even those that knew him would not be able to recognize him anymore. They did all of this in order to so weaken him that he would die quicker on the cross. And then they nailed him to the cross. They nailed his feet, and they nailed his hands. Those that experienced a crucifixion experienced death by suffocation. Because what would happen is, is that the way they were placed on those crosses, when they would be weakened and they would slump, it would cause their chest muscles to become paralyzed, making it impossible to to breathe, and the only way they could breathe them is to push up on the nails, to push up that are through his feet, to push up on the nails, push up and get a breath, and then when he couldn't take the pain on his feet anymore, he slumped back down, and he couldn't breathe. And it was over and over and over until there was no energy left, no strength left. He couldn't push up anymore. And he died by suffocation. Why did he do this? Why did he go through this? Long before he was ever crucified, he told his disciples, this is what I'm doing. This is why I'm doing it. He knew this would be his end. He came to suffer on the cross to pay the penalty 
for our sins. And the Bible says that there on the cross, God took all of your sins and my sins and he put all of our sins, those who were alive at the time, those who would come, he took our sins and he placed them on the cross, placed them on Jesus. And this is the verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, for he who knew no sin, he who had never sinned, became sin. For us, all of the sins of the world placed upon him became sin for us. Why? So that we could be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. There was an exchange that happened that moment. God took your sins and mine and put our sins on him and took his righteousness and made his righteousness available to us. He did it because... If he didn't die for us, we would have to pay for our own sins. And then the Bible says that he rose again from the grave. And here is what God says to us. If we'll come to understand we're sinners and we're separated from God and Jesus died for our sin and rose again, we can then come to know Christ as our Savior by committing our life to Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 puts it this way. If you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. If you will confess with your mouth, that word confession that he uses is meaning something that is true. If you will say something that is true, Lord Jesus... I've been on the throne of my life all my life. I've called the shots. I've done what I wanted. I've made the decisions. And all I have done is push myself further from you. I take myself off of the throne of my life. And Lord Jesus, I let you on the throne of my life. You be my Lord, which means my boss. You be the one in charge of my life. I surrender the The control of my life to you, I make you my Lord. If you'll say with your mouth, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised from the dead, it's not enough for mental assent. Oh, of course I believe in God. Of course I believe in Jesus. Of course I believe in the resurrection. No, that's not enough. He says to believe in your heart. It means to believe to the point of commitment. I commit my life to you. Doesn't mean I'm going to to be perfect from here on out, but I've settled the issue. You're my Lord. You're the one in charge of my life, and I commit my life to you. The Bible says that if we'll confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart to the point of commitment that Christ rose from the dead, that we will be saved. And the Bible says that when he saves us, he'll begin to change us from the inside out. There is a woman named Kim Puck Fon Tai. I hope I pronounced her her name right. She is actually the napalm girl. The napalm girl of a famous Vietnam War photo of June the 8th, 1972. For many in this room, that was way before you were born. But there was a Vietnam War. And there was a picture taken on June the 8th of 1972 that was burned in the memories of so many Americans. The, the Viet Cong had, had um, uh, exploded a napalm bomb that just burns everything with, within its reach. And, uh, um, uh, with a group of, uh, of uh, civilians. And there is a, one photo of that event in which there's a little girl that's nine years old and she's running as fast as she can, but she's been burned all over her body. And she's running as fast as she can and it's an American GI that grabs her and rescues her. That little nine-year-old girl is now a 55-year-old woman. And for every year since that event, for the last 46 years, Every single year she's gone through surgeries to work with another part of her body that got burned to take the scarring away. 
she's still having surgeries 46 years later. In the first 10 years after she accepted Christ, I mean after she had been burned, she came to know Jesus as her Savior. And what happened to her at the age of 19 is that she just came upon a New Testament. And she started reading the New Testament and the Gospels and she started hearing and reading about this Savior who had come and this, this one who had died for her sins and this one who could change your life from the inside out and this one who could give you, give you forgiveness for your sins and could give you the ability to forgive others. Because this young lady, over her, the course of her 10 years after this incident happened, she'd become a bitter, embittered, hate-filled woman of 19 years just hating so many people in her life. Look what's happened to me. How could this have happened to me? And she'd become so full of hate and anger and bitterness in her heart. And she began to read the story about Jesus from the New Testament. And she knew there was a church nearby, and she went to that church, and for the first time she heard the gospel, and she accepted Jesus Christ as her Savior. And her whole life, has been transformed. It, it didn't mean that she didn't have to go through all the surgeries and the scars. She did that. But what God did was change who was she was on the inside. And here's her story. My faith in Jesus has enabled me to forgive those who have hurt and scarred me. It has enabled me to pray for my enemies rather than curse them. It has enabled me not just to tolerate them, but to truly love them. Jesus can change your life too. And the invitation this morning is, if you've not yet accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, would you make that decision today? God's at work in your heart. If there's a want to in your heart, that's the Holy Spirit at work in your heart. Would you say yes to Him this morning? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for all that you've done and who Jesus is and what he did for us. And, oh, God, I pray for every individual in this room that has not yet made that decision that this would be the day of salvation, that this would be the moment that they would say yes to you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.